the other people, I think. Yeah, and you? Yeah. Okay, you can start. So there sorry, are the, uh, yeah. the yes, link. Sir. Sorry, can I confirm something? Yes, sir. The, yes, sir. Sure, sir. The link which I uh, you were you, you sent me. What I did, I shared with my brothers also. Yeah. So yeah. they will be again coming as a guest, I think. So if you could include them as a participant. So the names are Ganesh Siddham. Okay. Maya Sunda, hmm. Uh, Piyush, can you note these names? If you see them in the attendee list, you please add them as panelists. Yes, yes. I'm writing them down. Uh, please uh, tell me the names again, please. Note Kalpan already there. Sir, could you tell the names? And then, uh, and then whosoever is with the last name, uh, Siddham. Basically, uh, you will understand okay. that. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. And Chaya Ragoji also. Sorry. Yeah. I Chaya think... is there. Chaya Raghuji, yeah. I think it's in the yeah, attending list. Yeah, I can see Nanda, Dr. Nanda Kumar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Piyush, uh, Chaya Raghuji, I can see in the attendee list. Please add her as panelist. Yeah. Yes, I'm adding them. Yeah. Yeah. There's a certain Ganesh also in the list. But yeah, yeah. Right. Ganesh Siddham, <laughs> Shubhangi Siddham, all Siddham name, last name will be. In addition to that, it will be Raghuji and Patikonda. Patikonda. Okay. Okay. K -O -N -D -A. Okay. okay, sorry. Please continue. Hi, Ajay. Very pleasant morning to all our panelists and our delegates. In the words of Anthony J.D. Angelo, I quote, develop a passion for learning. If you do, you will never cease to grow. Embarking on yet another journey of knowledge and enlightenment, I, Dr. Shraddha Mahindra Ayer, your MOC for the day, feel extremely privileged and honored to be given this opportunity to welcome you all to the Srimati Sunanda B. Shidham Memorial CME, organized by the Vidarbha Association of Pathologists and Microbiologists, honoring the exceptional contributions by stalwarts in the field of cytopathology. As is customary each year, we are graced by the kind presence of Dr. Vinod Shidham sir with his family on this auspicious occasion. This year too, despite the COVID pandemic, we are fortunate enough to be able to conduct the CME in an online format under the aegis of the current VAPM president, Dr. Prachi Sancheti ma'am, honorary secretary, Dr. Ankita Tamre ma'am, and the entire VAPM team. On behalf of the VAPM committee, I would like to express our regards and sincere gratitude to all the dignitaries, delegates, and well-wishers who will be joining us online today. They say you are never too old to set another goal or to dream a new dream. We have amongst us a living replica of this very belief in the form of our chief guest for today, Dr. B.T. Shidham Sir, who I must mention is 95 years young and has spent these glorious years serving in the medical fraternity. I'm sure all our young delegates will take inspiration and be motivated by you, sir. We welcome you, sir. We would also like to extend our warm regards to our beloved mentor and a teacher of par excellence, Dr. Vinod Chidham, sir. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Ajay Maravar, sir, amongst our delegates. Sir has been a guiding light for most of us present here today. We welcome you, sir. With this, I would like to invite our dynamic president, Dr. Prachi Sancheti, ma'am, for the welcome address. A very good morning to all dignitaries and all the attendees who have joined us online. It is my proud privilege to welcome you to the 8th Srimati Sunanda B. Siddham Memorial CME. Uh, we have been organizing this CME courtesy Dr. Vinod Siddham, who has been a part of the VAPM family for the past so many years. And what is commendable about him is that in spite of being away from his hometown and his home country for so many years, he has still established a very strong connect and has been imparting and sharing his uh, knowledge in uh, the field, especially of cytopathology year after year with uh, the pathology fraternity here. And of course, uh, we are so 
grateful and happy to have Dr. B.T. Siddham here with us, who is the founder of the Siddham Foundation. And uh, for uh, needless to say, but uh, VAPM is always going to be indebted to the Siddham Foundation because they have been instrumental and have provided us huge aid so that today we can proudly say that we have an official office premises uh, in the city, in uh, the IMA building, thanks to them. Uh, for that, of course, we are always going to be grateful. And uh, we are so happy that uh, we are able to conduct this CME uh, today, uh, of course, in the online format. But uh, whenever possible, we know uh, that Sir will be uh, very much uh, eager to join us here, maybe next year or whenever possible. I also welcome uh, the members of the Siddham family, of the Siddham Foundation. Uh, you're most welcome. And again, once again, thank you for everything. And uh, without much ado, I shall uh, we shall begin uh, uh, with the rest of the proceedings. Uh, welcome once again. Uh, over to you, Shraddha. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now I request Dr. Ajay Marava, sir, if he is present with us amongst the delegates, to kindly share his thoughts on the occasion. Sir is there, I can see him. Yeah. Please unmute. Hi, on. I'm audible now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. On behalf of VAPM, I welcome you all here to the Srimati Sunanda Siddham Memorial Lecture Series. I am grateful to Vinod. Since so many years, he is giving these uh, lectures, maybe in India or from abroad. And <clears throat> I really uh, acknowledge his spirit for the academic excellence. And I had visited his house so many times. And his same enthusiasm he has uh, since, since his student life, when I was with him in the pathology department, and we have a long association with him. I'm grateful to him for uh, giving us the donation for the uh, Siddham Foundation. Thankful to Siddham Foundation also, which has enabled us to have uh, our office premises in IMA building. Now I hand over the mic to Shraddha Mahindra. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your kind words. Now I would like to request you all to join me in remembering Srimati Sunanda Shridham, ma'am, by observing a moment of silence. I think we can go ahead. Thank you, everyone. Uh, now I would like to request Dr. B.T. Shidham, sir, chief guest for the occasion, to kindly address the gathering and inaugurate today's CME. Hmm. Thank, Thank you, sir. Good, mo good morning. Good morning to your side and good night to okay. our side. I am very pleased bring pleasure to inaugurate this uh, CAB. This is the seventh CAB of my wife, late Sunanda Shiddham. And in the memory of her, the Vinod has conducted, organized, and give the, every year the CAB. This is the seventh CAB at present. Now, I, I have five children, all are doctors in different faculties. One pathology department, one in Nagpur pathologist, 
when his ophthalmologist is told of her daughter, my oldest son, as you know, is here in Detroit as a pathologist, an academist, and he have international lectures been called. And uh, <clears throat> second, last son is Ganesh, who is nephrologist, and his wife is endocrinologist at Columbus, Ohio, at in USA. And my daughter, Maya, is in Texas, and her husband is pediatrician, and she is also pediatrician practicing at in Texas, Victoria. These are my family experts. I am proud of their career and their self-efforts to, <clears throat> to have this develop their career in their own field or they are human. They are chosen the career to service the humanity in the form of medicine to serve the society and the community. Thank you very much. I'm inaugurating the CM7CME at Nagpur and online. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Our revered speakers and chairpersons have worked together in bringing forth an academic feast for all the delegates present here today. So without uh, much uh, further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker for the day, Dr. Vinod Chidham, sir, who needs no introduction and has indeed been a pioneer in the field of cytopathology. Shraddha, just a moment, Shraddha. Um, uh, so Dr. Vinod Chidham, uh, if any of the other persons yeah, from... Uh, uh, yeah, oh, yeah okay. that's uh, as a part of the opening yeah. uh, ceremony. We yes. have a few expression of thoughts from different... Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Siddham yes, Foundation sir. members. Please. Uh, let's go by whosoever wants to start. Uh, Baru, uh, I, we call Baru, sorry. <laughs> My youngest brother, yes. he is Dr. Ganesh Siddham. So uh, you want to start? Yeah, I, I can start. Uh, hi, uh, hello everyone. Uh, this is uh, Ganesh. Um, and this is my wife, uh, Shubhangi, and this is my mother-in-law. So we are all here in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, for my mom and for the family, uh, better known as Baru, uh, I'm also the youngest son uh, of, uh, of the siblings uh, and also known as Shendefer. Um, we are here to celebrate a life of our mom, who I would describe as a as a God-fearing, hard-working uh, mother with uh, un unconditional love to all. We would not have been uh, successful without the blessings and the hard work of I and Baba. On this uh, momentous occasion, one phrase describes the importance of mom. Swami Tini Chagacha Ai Vina Vikari Ai Chiyunyu Amala Nehmi Zanvel Love you, mom. Thanks. Pramod, uh, Shubha, you want to? Uh, no, I'm good. That's okay. uh, arts like Ganesh. Thank you. Yeah, good. Thanks a lot. Uh, Pramod, are you there? Kalpana, I can see you. Uh, Pramod is here. Uh, you want to say something? Hello. Good morning uh. to all. And wish you all the best for the VAPM success. And uh, Whatever is to be expressed has been expressed by Ganesh very well. I, I really remember mother on this day and uh, just express my gratitude for her. And uh, also thankful to Dada for bringing our family to the high level and taking it still now. Thanks. Chaya, Nandakumar. Uh, I think you have to start your uh, unmute your microphone. You just uh, put the uh, cursor on the screen. You will see the microphone on the left side. Just click on it. You put the camera off. You can put both camera and uh, microphone. Yeah, put the microphone on. 
on the left lower corner. There will be a red line. Instead of that, just click on it. It will, the red line will go away. Could you find the red line? Uh, sorry, uh, are you on, uh, my, uh, maybe you're on phone. We can't hear you. No, we can't hear you. Your microphone is off. The IT person, if can you unmute? Uh, yeah, now it is unmuted. Okay, good. Go ahead. But it's still not audible. Jiraji, uh, we can't hear you. Uh, Dr. Nandukumar, we can't hear you. We cannot hear you. Saraj has a she logged in from another day. Yes. Should we ask him to log in again? Yes, he is here. I would suggest he logs in from another device. Okay. Uh, can you call here? I'll call. Okay. I'll go to Hi, uh, we cannot hear you. In the meanwhile, uh, we'll kind of uh, proceed with uh, other other participants. Anybody who is online and or, or in the participant uh, mode, uh, if you want to speak, SS means is it Shushrut? You want to unmute your microphone if it is possible? He's on call, so he's taking it from the hospital. So I'm not sure whether he can. Yeah, is Shushrut yeah, there? I, yeah, but I'm, a, I'm busy. I'm, I'm going to start okay, a case. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I, I knew that. So uh, he's in the hospital. Yeah, he's on call. OK, go ahead. So, as uh, we uh, every year uh, have the opportunity, to... ah, now he's there. I think, Doctor Nandukumar, can you speak now? Ah, can you listen? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, go ahead. First of all, like. Congratulate Vino Siddham conducting the CME on in memory of my mother in law Sunanda Siddham. Uh, I am the first son in law of uh, Dr. B.T. Siddham. So I once again congratulate for Vinod for taking all the pains and everything for conducting such a CME. It is one of the best CME. Uh, which I have attended two, three times in Nagpur. Now this is because of the online, it is not possible for me to take, because I am using mobile. Thank you once again. Thank you, Nanduvia. Uh, and Chaya is there or she's some yeah, other place? I am, in the office. I am in the office, Chaya is in the house. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you very much. Thank and you. So everybody, uh, uh, welcome to the CME. And as usual, every year we celebrate the life of my mother, who has been a very uh, enthusiastic uh, person when it comes to the education. She had always uh, supported and encouraged the education. And so based on that, Same in her as memory, as we as thought as that as we as should as be as doing as something. As uh, now you can mute yourself, uh, Dr. Nandakumar. Ah, yes. So, Let's uh, continue with the actual program. And uh, as uh, we know, this year the topic is uh, serous fluid cytopathology. And I thought that that will be right time because the second edition of my book is coming. So some of the new things also we could be discussing and uh, some of the algorithms and some photographs which I'm having from the second edition would be also shared here. So back to Dr. Mahindra. Thank you, sir. On behalf of the entire VAPM committee, I would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Vinod Shiddham, sir, and the entire Shiddham family for expressing their kind thoughts. Our ever speakers and chairpersons have worked hard together in bringing forth an academic feast for all the delegates today. So without uh, much further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker for the day, Dr. Vinod Shiddham, sir, who needs no introduction, 
and he has indeed been a pioneer in the field of cytopathology. So should we start? Uh, just a moment, she'll invite the chairperson. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Vinod B. Shidham, our first speaker for the day, has pursued his MD in pathology, has done FRCP path, and has also um, has the degree of FIAC to his uh, feather. He is also a co-editor-in-chief and executive director with the Cyto Journal, so is president of Cytopathology Foundation, Inc., and director of Cytopathology Fellowship. So is currently serving as professor and vice chair, as well as the director of Cytopathology at the Department of Pathology Wayne State University of uh, School of Medicine, Carmenos Cancer Center, and Detroit Medical Center. To chair the session, we have amongst us the very pleasant Dr. Mohini Dave Ma'am. Ma'am has uh, pursued her MBBS in MD in Pathology and is a senior consultant pathologist working in Nagpur. I invite you both, sir and ma'am, for the first session. Sir would be throwing light on the topic serious fluid cytopathology, a second foreign population, and the skip approach. I request you all to kindly post your questions, if any, in the comment section below, and would now hand over the dais to Dr. Mohini Dave Madam for the further proceedings. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma uh, good morning, everyone, and good evening, sir. I would like to thank uh, Prachi and Ankita for giving me the honor of chairing this session. Sir is going to talk on serious fluid cytology, second foreign population, and SCIP approach. It has always been a pleasure uh, to listen to Dr. Siddham, and without wasting much time, I would hand over the mic to Sir for a 45 minutes of total academic bliss for all of us. Over to you, Sir. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so, as we decided, the topic will be divided into two parts. So, I will start with the first part. So give me some time to share the screen. Can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good. Okay, as uh, we are aware, that uh, being a quite a big topic, as we know, there is a book on that. So <laughs> I can talk whole day from it. And initially, uh, one of the presentation I had done is in four parts for four hours. So that I have crunched into a two part and first part will be more of a morphology and second will be more of an application of immunohistochemistry. And uh, as an acknowledgement, Mm, most of the tables and figures and algorithms are from my first uh, book uh, or the uh, and the first edition and the new edition is coming maybe in April May. Uh, as I said, uh, it will divide into two parts and part one includes anatomy, histology, cytology, and effusions, then collection and transportation factors leading to potential diagnostic pitfalls, approach to diagnostic cytopathology of effusions and panorama of different phases of mesothelial cells, which is very important in understanding the evaluation of effusion cytology. As everybody knows, typically there are four effusion cavities, uh, that is a peritoneal cavity, left and right pleural cavity, and pericardial cavity. Normally there is hardly any fluid in it because the space which is there between these organs is just a capillary space and you can't tap any fluid. But whenever there is a pathology, the uh, fluid will accumulate as a effusion process. Normally, the serous cavities are lined by a thin layer of stroma, and over that is a covering of the flat layer of mesothelial cells, which when there is any damage or any reaction or any uh, injury, the cells become very 
reactive, they become polyhedral, and these polyhedral large cells, then they can exfoliate in the fluid. And then uh, when you examine those, these mesothelial cells themselves can look like slightly abnormal. And that is the reason why, unless you have a proper approach in interpreting this cytopathology of effusion fluids, uh, depending on your level of training and comfort, most of the time, there's a very high level of atypical or suspicious interpretation. Today only in the uh, discussion with my resident, I was explaining and that's what he thought because initial interpretation by most uh, for most of them had been atypical or suspicious. And all of those cases, if applied properly, they could be divided into typical binary interpretation that is either negative or positive. Most of the time they are negative in that case. For understanding that, you should understand the cytology of the mesothelial cells. The reactive mesothelial cells or mesothelial cells are typically polyhedral cells. Normally they are flat, but the moment they become reactive, they are quite large. And when they fall in the fluid, they acquire a polyhedral shape because of the surface tension phenomena. And when you are making a cytology preparation, it usually has a nucleus, which is in the center or near tense center. And then cytoplasm has a typical two zone or two tones uh, uh, staining pattern. As you can see here, the central portion is darker in a pap stain and the peripheral portion is slightly faint. And this that two zone is very easy to be interpreted and you can even see that in the HNE stained cell block section slides. So when it comes to the peripheral portion of it, it's related with the microvilla and a tendency to show the vacuoles at the periphery, contrary to other cells where you'll find that, you'll find that, uh, hold on please. Huh? Okay, so basically that understanding of two zone staining is very important, but look at the pattern of the nucleus. The nucleus, if you go by individual cell morphology, one can easily confuse it for malignant cells. Uh, similarly, when you have a diffuse stain preparation, same thing happens. You have a nucleus. You can't see the nuclear chromatin pattern that well as hyperchromacy as we are used to evaluate the malignancy, but it can usually show the rest of the features, including the shape, size, and the nucleolar presence or absence, which uh, doesn't make a difference. Rather, presence of nucleoli in most of the situation is in more in favor of a reactive process. When it comes to the cytoplasm in DIFQIC, the central portion is slightly pale and the periphery is usually darker. And there are these ruffled blebs at the periphery, which kind of uh, correlates with the microvilli. So presence of microvilli are a good uh, point in favor of uh, mesothelial origin of the cells. And that's the reason why once upon a time, people used to do electron microscopy to demonstrate the microvilli. But if you really look at it carefully, even the simple stain like DIFQIC can give you a clue that probably these cells are the one which are mesothelial cells and that ruffled border and with the small blebs, which can be variable, but they will always be there easily seen on the reactive mesothelial cells or mesothelial cells. Uh, as all of us, we know that broadly uh, effusions can be divided into exudate and transudate, normally based on the level of the proteins. If the proteins are high, it is exudate. Uh, people like to have the number. So usually 2.5 gram per 100 uh, ml. Some people call it three gram per 100, um, uh, per 100 ml, but that's not important. It's important is an exudate is an inflammatory process or a uh, process related to the increased permeation of permeability of the capillaries. When it comes to transudate, it is more of a uh, mechanical one and where the level of uh, albumin or protein in the effusion fluid is less. So generally you don't have to do any cytology if it is a transudate. And if it is an exudate, then you might have to perform the cytology. But the most important clue is if the effusion fluids are bloody, they have a lot of blood, then there is a chance that many of these are associated with underlying malignancy. And many of the times we also know which is the primary possibility because there's a history, but sometimes you may not know. So if there is a effusion which has blood, then the chance that it has a chances, a higher chance that it is a malignant effusion. But there are many other conditions where which are reactive conditions 
and you can have the bloody effusion, just like paranemonic effusions, post-traumatic effusions, pulmonary embolism, asbestos exposure, uh, exposure uh, pancreatitis, acute aortic dissection, endometriosis, sarcoidosis, intraoral over pulmonary sequestration, and some infections. But generally, uh, those cases, the clinical scenario is not suspicious for cancer. And without any uh, specific uh, background, uh, if there is a bloody effusion or there is a history of cancer and then there is a bloody effusion, their concern is there might be an underlying malignancy. The issue sometimes come is many people feel comfortable uh, in uh, examining the surgical pathology or histopathology specimen. And so if you want to use that in this scenario, it is again is of not that much of importance when it comes to the biopsy or surgical uh, specimens. Because if you look at the biopsy, even if you take biopsies, multiple biopsies, you will be taking focal points here and there. And many times these lesions might be diffuse or maybe focal, and it might be difficult for you to visualize where the exact lesion is. So you'll take the random biopsy and you might miss easily, uh, as we can see, you make a biopsy from here, but the small lesions are in other place. And you can easily miss uh, the positive uh, metastatic disease. That we observe very often um, in the routine practice. Contrary to that, in case of cells, these cells fall in the spaces and then they accumulate as effusion fluid. And if you take this effusion fluid, all these sites are indirectly sampled and chances of capturing these malignant cells is very high when it comes to the cytology. So basically, bottom line is uh, effusion fluid is much more sensitive and a proper method of evaluating for malignancy whenever it is indicated. Again, when you are collecting, transporting, and processing the specimen, some of the things are very important, and sometimes it could be underestimated and could lead to compromisation of interpretation. So I'm just mentioning here that when you want to ideally collect the specimen, and if that specimen uh, is collected in a anticoagulant, then chances are better, but many times you don't have that opportunity. But if somebody is interested and they would like to organize properly, then the possible uh, anticoagulant, uh, anticoagulants which can be used are EDTA or it could be uh, sodium citrate, just like our uh, blood uh, transfusion related anticoagulant. It is better not to use the sodium oxalate or heparin because sodium oxalate can uh, can or sodium or potassium oxalate can cause crystals and then it could be uh, distorting the morph cytomorphology. When it comes to heparin, it is okay, but uh, remember that heparin is a polysaccharide and because of that, diff quick will lead to a background hue and staining may not be good when it comes to the diff quick staining. Uh, as far as the amount of fluid is concerned, you get whatever range if you don't mention it. But ideally, it should be as much specimen is collected uh, up to 1000. You don't want two or three or four liters, but 1000 up to 1000, it is good so that you can concentrate as many cells as possible from the sediment and then uh, process it well, including preparation of a good cell block. Uh, the best way is to collect the specimen as a fresh, unfixed specimen and that uh, if it can be transported to the lab quickly that is better and if it is not processed immediately one can store in uh, refrigerator at 4 degrees centigrade without any uh, freezing uh, this is important to understand because contrary to other specimens effusion fluid as we already said is rich in uh, protein and other things so it's like a tissue culture medium so stability of the cells in this is quite good uh, even if it is there for a while at room temperature, it will be having a better morphology. And so better not to collect in fixative or in a preservative because then that will lead to a lot of uh, other problems. Uh, if we, there is any question, I could address that in detail, uh, but I don't think uh, you need to because for example, somebody submits it in formally, then you can't use it for proper uh, preparation of cytology preparation. If you collect it in a alcoholic fixative or cytolite and other things, then it will compromise the immunoreactivity pattern and your immunohistochemistry results will not be good. So all those things are well known, but if somebody has a discussion uh, uh, question, we could talk about that. And lastly, many of those that we already said that when it comes to malignancy, they could be blood rich. And if there is a lot of uh, blood or a lot of RBCs, 
then that RBCs could interfere with the um, uh, processing and including preparation of the cell block. So the best approach would be to lyse these RBCs and make a um, concentrated uh, um, sediment which is rich in the nucleated cells. And that can be done by a very nice and simple method, something like what we call ammonium chloride based lysis, which is commonly used in flow cytometry where immunoreactivity pattern is maintained. And there are these days the reagents available, such as blood lease. And so this will be a good uh, algorithm to say if there is a specimen, you collect it uh, either with or without anticoagulant. And from that, you can directly make the smear. That will give you idea how cellular the specimen is. This is very important when your differential is with the mesothelioma. Otherwise, this doesn't have that much of importance. So many places where mesothelioma is not that frequent in the differential diagnosis, you can skip that approach. Again, even though it is submitted uh, 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 sometimes in anticoagulant, but most of the time it is submitted as a fresh. And so many of these uh, specimens could clot and make important to note that when it clots, sometimes most of the diagnostic cells might be trapped in the clot. And if you process this clot for the cell block, they will be caught. But if you are not making a cell block routinely, which sometimes some places they do not, then your remaining specimen may not have that many cells and your quality of the cytology specimen may not be good. So processing this clot for making the cell block is very important so that you do not lose the diagnostic cells. Uh, once you have this specimen, what you do is uh, the supernatant other than the clot or the entire specimen, you concentrate and try to get as much sediment as possible. And that specimen, which is at the bottom after leaving it, leaving it uh, at uh, uh, gravity for a while, the supernatant can be discarded and that homogenized uh, sediment can be concentrated further. And once that concentrated button is there, make a smear preparation from that. They could be either direct smears or cytospins or sure path or thin prep or any other method. Basically here, what is important to mention as we'll see it in the uh, further, um, uh, what you call um, uh, presentations, that uh, better to have pap smears and diffic smears both. So if you want to do that, sure path and thin prep, of course, can be done for thin prep, uh, sorry, a papanicolostain, but you can't have a diff quick out of it. But you can make a diff quick from the direct smear or from the cytospin. And cytospin has a other option called mega funnel, and you could do that. And again, we could uh, discuss in some other time if there is any question in the details about it. Another thing is making the cell block, which can be made by various ways. Again, we are not discussing in detail about various methodologies but uh, most commonly used are histogel or plasma thrombin method. And recently next gen cell blocking kits are available in the form of nano and micro. And I think we had a nice uh, workshop at Nagpur about that. And so basically what we recommend is having a cell block routinely whenever it is required uh, for the differential diagnosis of malignancy. Otherwise also it is good because in future after four or five years, there might be an opportunity for some special uh, molecular studies available. And that time cell block material is always available as an archival material. Uh, now processing of the uh, smears, as we said, uh, just to highlight here, which we have mentioned in the list there, it can be direct smears and this direct smears can be as a wet fix, which can be stained with PAP, or they can be air dried. Air, air dried smears can be used for both, for diff quick staining. And as you know, these days, many of the labs are using, you can rehydrate the, air dried smears, post fixed in 95% uh, alcohol with 5% acetic acid, and then stain with the rapid PAP or the uh, rehydration PAP uh, protocol. And you will have very good results with this. So depending on that, uh, air drying all the smears and staining it for both is always, always good. Other approaches, some places may not have a good way of making the direct smears. So you can have cytospin preparations. And this cytospin preparation again can be wet fixed or air dried and accordingly uh, similar to a, a direct smear, most, uh, as we mentioned. It could be air dried or wet fixed and do both diff quick and pap stain. Another, they are not very common, but filters were used once a time for pap staining, but that will not give a good opportunity to stain with diff quick. 
And then of course, liquid-based cytology, either sure path, thin prep, and there are many other non-proprietary methods. And for non-GYN and preparation, you don't need any FDA approval and you can use many other methods. But they are also the same problem because uh, the specimen is processed through a weak fixative. And because of that, uh, most of the time, the stain is pap stain with a wet fix type approach and you can't use it for diff quick. So that's the normal way you, you will have one smear, which is a direct smear from undiluted specimen. This gives a semi-quantitative evaluation of celerity of the specimen. But this is not that uh, important if your differential is not mesothelial that often. But uh, the same celerity can also be judged by other uh, uh, preparations because once you have a same uh, approach for preparing the specimen in your lab, over a period of time, you'll get idea whether the specimen is cellular or not. Again, uh, for the diff quick smear, it can be direct smear or cytospin. This is actually a megafunnel cytospin. Uh, and the pap stain smear could be either the sure path or it could be thin prep. And then of course, lastly, cell block preparation is always important. Once you have the specimen properly collected, transported and processed, and you have prepared the proper uh, staining, it is important to understand the approach for achieving the best results. And this is what is important. If you have a specimen which have unequivocal malignant cells, just making a small uh, direct smear and um, staining with a pap might be sufficient. And if you know already, the patient has um, poorly differentiated carcinoma of lung. So it is metastatic carcinoma of lung. You don't need to do anything. But that other extreme, there might be a patient who had a lobular carcinoma breast about 10 years before, and now she's coming with a effusion. And as you know, lobular carcinoma breast, the cells are low grade and reactive mesothelial cells can go to the level that some of them have the morphology of malignant cells. And so they are also singly scattered. Reactive mesothelial cells are also singly scattered. Um, so those could be very difficult to differentiate from the uh, lobular carcinoma breast. And then there's a huge spectrum from that poorly differentiated clear cut diagnostic cells to very bland looking, singly scattered, difficult to interpret and differentiate from reactive mesothelial cells type of cells. And so it is important to process the specimens in such a way that you get the best out of it. And we already said that when it comes to having one pap stain, one diff quick stain, uh, you can have pap stain as a sure path or thin prep or direct smear, and then having a cell block is a better approach. And this is what we'll be discussing here, how to do it more methodical way. And as far as the immunohistochemistry is concerned or cytochemistry is concerned, we'll have part two, but it's in the same list. So there is a general feature, which we'll discuss then processing related features, then interpretation strategy and the cytomorphology. So in general features, it is important to understand that effusion fluid has unique diagnostic challenges. And uh, these unique diagnostic challenges are uh, not only just appearance of the cells, but the problem associated with the management, which sometimes could be underestimated. And what I mean by that is, yes, lightly saying atypical or suspicious, uh, then it makes, <laughs> as we always joke, that you don't want to be an atypical cytopathologist or atypical pathologist. And so don't call anything atypical or suspicious. We would like to give a definitive diagnosis. And if you call a definitive diagnosis, you have to call it negative or positive, or basically positive for malignant cells. And if you call something positive for malignant cells, in this case, this always means that you are talking and conveying the message that the disease is incurable. It's a metastatic disease. So you have to be really careful. And so in case you are not sure about positivity, it is better to back off and could repeat and maybe uh, there will be some reference to this particular issue in the latter phase. Again, uh, morphological features, what we normally used to see in maybe at one extreme on one cell, in case of pap smear in cervical cytology, you will call it abnormal. There it is a screening test. At other extreme, uh, you have uh, FNA and you get typical appearance of the malignant cells or brushings and you can see and call it malignant. But in case of cervical, uh, sorry, in case of effusion cytology, that feature is less uh, reliable because most of the uh, features which you use in exploitative brushing or FNA cytology, you cannot directly apply it for serous fluid cytology or effusion cytology. 
And uh, this might not be applicable to a high grade neoplasm or pleomorphic cells, but the standard criteria which we use in these cases cannot be used here. And the reason for that, are, I already mentioned, is the spectrum of the reactive mesothelial cells is so or different that some of them might even go and look like really malignant cells. And if you are going to use those as individual features, you will always find some atypical or suspicious cells. And that will not be reliable criteria to um, apply. And then most important is that understanding that anything which falls in the fluid and if it is there for a while, they have a tendency to round up. And that is because of the surface tension phenomena of the fluid. And so let's see at one extreme, uh, the tumor might be having columnar cells or they can be spindle cells, but when it comes to those, when it is in the fluid, they will not, they may not show that shape and they will round up. So other things are processing related and that is, uh, that processing related thing is, we already highlighted the issue that reactive mesothelial cells have the problem of looking like or having an overlap with the some of the malignant cells. And so if you can make out that these are mesothelial cells, whatever the way you can, either morphologically or by using the immunohistochemistry and about morphology, we already saw what is that typical pattern of the mesothelial cells is there. And I always ask uh, new, new, new people who are coming under training to look at a couple of normal looking reactive uh, serous fluids and get a feel of how the mesothelial cells look like. Basically get introduced to see, uh, maybe if I have to compare that with uh, probably butterflies. Uh, and you, need, you see butterflies, there are a lot of butterflies, they look different. But once you see a couple of them, you know that oh, these are butterflies. So that spectrum of that, once you see, uh, will help you a lot being a morphological science. That's what one should practice. Once you know that, and rest of the thing which is normally present in the serous fluid is the inflammatory cells. So either they are reactive mesothelial cells or inflammatory cells. If you do not see those, and instead of that, you are seeing a third or additional, what I use the word second foreign population, then that is in a more or less equivalent to metastatic population. So it is a very simple approach, which we follow in effusion fluid. At this level, I want to highlight very clearly that this will not be applicable to the uh, peritoneal washings and other washings, because there it will be, uh, oh, what is the time now? Okay. So it will be uh, difficult to say that um, uh, few cells, if they are there, uh, they could be even uh, reactive mesothelial cells. In that case, then you could use the immunohistochemistry for uh, confirming that as a second population. And that second population, again, is based on multiple features, including the cytoplasmic and other, but even the nuclear details are important to be evaluated. And for that, so second foreign population is better seen in DFQIC, but its nuclear details are better seen in second foreign population. And then there should be a way to do the semi-quantitative evaluation, which I already said that direct smear helps you, but it's not that strongly important unless you have very frequent specimens for mesothelioma. And then you need a objective way to confirm the differential diagnosis of primary. And for that, invariably, you will use the immunohistochemistry. As far as the interpretation uh, strategy is concerned, we already highlighted that the reactive mesothelial cells has an overlapping morphology with neoplastic cells. And uh, some of the uh, cells, specifically when there's only a single population that favors some mesothelial cells, and if that single population, in the sense, inflammatory cells, we can always see very easily. It should not be a problem. And we'll have the algorithm to uh, approach that. But in general, inflammatory cells, we don't have to worry. So if you have a population other than the mesothelial cells and that second foreign population with a known history, it might be very easy. When it comes to detection of that second population of cells, Romanovsky stains is very good. Uh, again, objective confirmation can be done by immunohistochemistry that we'll see that there at the end. But rarely you might have uh, one population and that, that part we'll be again discussing at a later stage. As far as the death of the indi or individual death or the individual uh, necrosis of the cells is concerned, as you know, usually it is associated with the 
malignancy and if you start seeing the apoptosis, important is it should not be in the inflammatory cells. If you start seeing the apoptosis, be careful and evaluate further because invariably it is associated with malignancy. So once you, uh, sh but for that, you have to be sure that those, not, those are not in the uh, inflammatory cells. When it comes to cytomorphology, again, when there are cell groups which are cohesive and there is a nice intracellular cohesion, that is a sign of uh, epithelial uh, type of adioplasm. Depending on their arrangement, they could be suggestive of papillary configuration. The cytoplasmic cells, uh, cytoplasm of the neoplastic cells look slightly different. Again, they have a tendency to show a uh, touching to the periphery of the nucleus. And because of the lack of the microvilla in the adenocarcinoma, we'll see some of the images. And then there might be some special structures which can be useful for cytomorphology. So in brief, if you highlight this uh, algorithm and look at the cells in the effusion, they could be mesothelial cells. And if they are mesothelial cells, depending on how cellular the specimen is, how do we have three-dimensional groups? Are they mostly single? And if they are without any three-dimensional group, mostly single and few in number, favor a reactive mesothelial population. But when it comes to the mesothelioma, which is a neoplastic one, then we will have to use the qualitative and quantitative approach to interpret that along with the clinical uh, correlation, including taking of the pleura and occupational history and other. And we will have at the end a, a, a algorithm to achieve that, how to come to a conclusion of mesothelioma. This particular thing will not allow us to cover everything. If it is a non-mesothelial cell population, and if those are hematopoietic cells or inflammatory cells, then it is a reactive process. And if they look abnormal or they have maybe flow and other issues or clear-cut features of uh, atypical lymphocytes, then they can be lymphoma. And most of the time here, the uh, primary uh, history is there for the lymphoma. Mostly what we are concerned is the second foreign population of neoplastic cells other than hematopoietic cells, and then there can be carcinoma, sarcoma, or melanoma. And in that, mostly carcinoma are most common, and in that also, most of the time, it is adenocarcinoma. And this, I'm talking about the uh, adult population. When it comes to the children population, then the blue cell tumor and lymphoma are more common. And when it comes to sarcoma and melanoma, they're usually not that very common. And if it is there, usually we'll have the history of that. Uh, again, depending on the clinical scenario, we might uh, confirm the primary based on the history and the immunohistochemistry. The panorama of uh, different phases of mesothelial cells is a long list. Uh, everybody knows about it, so I will not read it carefully. But most important is if you go and use the word atypical, avoid that. Always call it reactive. If you want to call and you are sure those are mesothelial cells, your differential is not mesothelioma, then you call it floridly reactive mesothelial cells. If you suspect that those are mesothelial cells and you are worried about mesothelioma, then atypical mesothelial cells might be justified, which is very rare. So better not to call those cells as reactive, uh, sorry, uh, if they're floridly reactive mesothelial cells and you are not worried about mesothelioma, don't call them atypical mesothelial cells. Again, this is a diff quick uh, uh, stain thing and you can see how bland a small nucleus can be or sometimes they can be really large. And so there is a big spectrum and rest of the time, the two zone pattern, ruffled border and all those things are better seen in diff quick. And this is a, a small uh, uh, template showing in the same case, there are all the cells ranging from very small nucleus and binucleate even to a large nucleus, sometimes eccentric, but there is always a thin rim of cytoplasm at the periphery. It won't touch it because of the microvilli. So if you just go by one cell or two cell, many of them might look malignant, but if you see carefully, they are all brothers and sisters and they are from the same spectrum. Same way, you could also evaluate some of the features in uh, Papanicolaou stain, uh, the same two zone pattern. And when you look at a, uh, from the same case, uh, from one end, very bland looking, small nucleus to sometimes hyperchromatic, large, irregular nuclei. And sometimes they could be even confused for malignancy if you look at the individual cells. So having that spectrum is very important. And once you know a typical nuclear feature, they are easy to identify. And that I always highly highlight that. Look at the cell, which is unequivocal reactive mesothelial cell, focus on the nucleus, 
if the nucleus is a particular type, and then you can try to find out remaining cells, whether they are similar to that nucleus, and then probably most of the time those are the reactive mesothelial cells. Again, to highlight that thin rim of cytoplasm at the periphery, that is because it won't, it won't touch to the periphery because of the microhelus pattern. Contrary to that, when it comes to the adenocarcinoma, when this, is, this feature is better seen in diff quick, as I said, in the adenocarcinoma, it will touch to the periphery. Of course, if it doesn't touch, it doesn't help. But if they're touching to the periphery, that shows that as a foreign population or second foreign population, contrary to the uh, mesothelial cells. This picture is not that well um, appreciated in the pap groups. It's from the same patient. And look at this. There are those eccentric uh, nuclei with the touching to the periphery. And these are the reactive mesothelial cells. But uh, they are not that easily seen. Here, you can just see the two population very easily. That's the reason why having a good diff quick smear for evaluation of um, uh, serous fluid is very important. But in addition, you also need the pap smear because you can see in pap smear the nuclear features quite well as compared to diff quick. And so having pap smear is also important. And if there are clear cut high grade cells, which are malignant, including, including presence of apoptotic bodies, which are present in the tumor cells. Now, these are not inflammatory cells. So once you are sure it is not inflammatory cell, obviously this is very easy to say that uh, these are uh, metastatic disease. Here, don't, uh, here the second population is not seen. Only population is mostly malignant cell. There will be here and there are few reactive mesothelial cells, but uh, uh, they, that will not be very important. Here's obviously it is a malignant one. So there are, <coughs> Uh, again, I don't, uh, because it will be long, uh, longer one, so I don't want to read this, but there are some factors which could lead to uh, pitfalls in the false positive interpretation. And so those are commonly seen, and I have seen that most of the time you get attracted to the prominent nuclear or aromatic figures, but if you want to be making it generalized, don't focus your diagnosis based on that. Most of mm -hmm. the reactive processes will have prominent nuclear, nucleoli and mitotic figures. And then there are many other things which can give rise to unexpected pattern, and those could be confused for. In, very interesting is sometimes in the pulmonary circulation, megakarocytes can come in the pleural fluid and they can look like malignant, but there'll be very few here and there. And as you know, megakarocyte will be better seen in diff quick, and generally the nuclear smudgy and they're not uh, that uh, uh, nicely seen, but sometimes they could be confused for malignancy. Again, uh, it is always important to understand that patient may have uh, cancer, but the effusion could be negative. So it doesn't mean that history of cancer is there. And so the patient uh, will have the effusion which is related to the uh, cancer only. So it could be a true negative in a patient with cancer and there are multiple regions that is blockage of lymphatics can be there or that effusion is not related to cancer, but increased permeability in v because of VGF and then lack of exfoliation in a low-grade sarcoma and other basic reasons which can be there. Uh, so as far as the cytomorphological features, which are suggestive of a particular primary, can be achieved by cytomorphology. But the best approach these days is the availability of uh, immunohistochemistry and very nice immunomarkers. Like, for example, patient has a colon CA, you just do CK20 and CDX2, and that will give you a diagnosis of uh, or confirmation of colonic primary. But uh, just to show that there are features which can be guiding you there and may suggest what is the possible primary. And I won't go to the detail. Uh, most of us are uh, conversant with these factors and some of those could help to correlate with your uh, clinical history. And accordingly, you can come to a diagnosis. So this was the end of part one. I'm not sure whether you would like to have the small uh, session for the question and answer. And then we can have part two afterwards, which is mostly on immunohistochemistry and some other additional algorithms based on this first part. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. That was really wonderful as usual. Uh, I would like to now hand over the mic to the organizers for question and answer session. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for helping us visit our re uh, revisit our basics, sir. I'm sure your talk will help uh, young postgraduates and budding pathologists like <laughs> myself. Uh, so we have a question in the comment box by our uh, very own IMA president, Dr. Sanjay Devutale, sir. Uh, sir is asking, can we use acetic acid for hemolysis, sir? 
Yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, in fact, uh, I have highlighted that in the first beginning. So what happens is if you use any process and if you are compromising the immunoreactivity pattern or potential of that particular cells, then you should not use that process. It could be fixative, it could be hemolysis agent, it could be whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, whatever, whatever interference you are going to have with that particular uh, reagent will compromise the immunoreactivity pattern. And when people say that, oh, no, no, but we can get the immunoreactivity or immunostains very nicely, very, very brisk, that's not a problem. So there are some reagents which can enhance the immunoreactivity pattern and there are some um, uh, reagents which could uh, inhibit it. What is important is ultimately your data is going to be compared with the data which is developed on formalin fixed tissue. And then, uh, so classical example is in Canada, they had done this a uh, lot of FNS those days on the breast and they were collecting, in, collecting it in cytolite which is an alcoholic fixative and their results of ERPR used to be wrong. And then when they did a core biopsy, the ERPR was wrong, uh, ERPR was negative on FNA and then core biopsy it was positive. Same thing was happening recently in uh, uh, lung, as you know, uh, because they need uh, to know whether it is a uh, squamous cell carcinoma or adenocarcinoma and we do a TTF1, P40, P53. And there also the same problem used to be there TTF1 was negative because of satellite, and when they did a core biopsy or something, TTF1 was positive, and they were not happy with it. The reason being that. So in same uh, continuation of that, if you use acetic acid, definitely acetic acid, obviously, as you know, being an acid, it will um, make the uh, immunoprofile abnormal. And so that's the short answer would be, you should not use acetic acid for lysis of RBCs. But if you are looking for morphology only, only morphology. If you're not going to do the immunocharacterization of those cells, yes, acetic acid can lyse it and is a very simple and cheap method, but the best approach would be to use ammonium chloride-based flow cytometry type uh, lysing agent, specifically if, if you are going to use those uh, sediment cells for um, immunocharacterization. Thank you, that was a good question. Thank you, Dr. Devatane, sir. Thank you, Dr. Vidnod Chidham, sir, for spending your precious time in uh, solving our queries. Um, thank you, Dr. Mohini Dave, ma'am, for sparing your valuable time and sharing the session. We really appreciate it, ma'am. Uh, I'm sure all of us will agree that despite the recent advances in technology and even artificial intelligence coming in, morphology still constitutes the cornerstone in pathology. With this, I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Supreeta Nayak, ma'am, for her talk on the topic Cytology of Lymph Nodes, Mistakes and Lessons Learned. Dr. Supreeta, ma'am, has pursued her MBBS and MD in Pathology and is currently associated as Associate Professor, Department of Pathology, Government Medical College, Nagpur. To chair the session, we have amongst us the very vivacious Dr. Anupama Gupta, ma'am. Ma'am has pursued her MBBS in MD in Pathology, currently working as Associate Professor in GMC Nagpur. Also, she is the President of Lions Club Nagpur South 2021-22. Ma'am has been the moderator in the MAPCON PG quiz 2019 to 2022. Her other qualifications include, she has passed computer exam, MSCIT, and has a diploma in clinical research and control trials. She has a vast teaching experience of 29 years in Government Medical College and has been a PG guide for the last 16 years. Ma'am loves cytology and uh, learning new teaching innovations. Uh, Ma'am has been a part of various interesting case discussions in MAPCON and VAPM slide seminars regularly. She has co-authored many papers and posters presented at the state chapter conferences and national conferences and has been invited as faculty and delivered talks in various workshops and conferences, both at regional and national levels. Ma'am has many publications in various national as well as international journals. Ma'am, we all know, has been the quiz master in VAPM Vidharpa level state level pathology quiz, and also the GMC and VAPM state level postgraduate quiz 2014. She has, she's an active participant in uh, quiz questioner uh, committee for UG and PG quiz since the last 10 years. Ma'am has worked as an editor uh, newsletter for three years, and as committee member of VAPM. 
Uh, she has worked in organizing committee of various conferences, including the Indian Academy of Cytology, MAPCON, many conferences, uh, workshops, and CMEs. Has also won prizes in poster contest and voluntary blood donors organization. And she's a member of the IAC, VAPM, IMA, Academy of Medical uh, Sciences, Nagpur. Um, the proud partner, uh, Dr. Praveen Gupta, sir, is, an, is a surgeon working in Nagpur. And they are blessed with two beautiful and uh, wonderful sons, Aman and Akshar. Over to you, ma'am. I request you, ma'am, to kindly unmute yourself. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Shraddha. Thank you. It was a very uh, elaborate whatever I said. You read it. Thank you so much anyway. Uh, very good morning to all and good evening to you, sir. Uh, we all know that uh, lymph node is not just lymphomas. It includes various benign inflammatory lesions, immunologies, logical lesions, malignancies, etc., etc. And cytology definitely is the most accepted first-line investigation for palpable as well as deep-seated nodes. And uh, cytologists must be keenly aware along with uh, what is the clinical contest and what is expected of us to report. So let's hear it from our today's very vibrant speaker, my dear friend Supreeta Nayak, who has, I would like to say some words for her. She has a presentation style so unique, makes learning easy and quick. I call her thesaurus, but she is actually a cytology genius. Let's learn lessons, improve mistakes with grace through approach to notes by speaker par excellence. Thank you very much, uh, Shraddha. And it's over to Supreeta Nayak for her talk. Welcome, Supreeta. You can go ahead with your present, uh, with your talk. A very good morning to all of you. I hope you all can hear me. And thank you so much, Anupama, Madam, for this wonderful introduction. I was actually I'm taken aback and speechless. I should be, <laughs> uh, I should say. And uh, can I ask the organizers to run the lecture that I have sent it? because there seems to be some connectivity problem from my end. So, oh, I'm sure. it right now. Yes, ma'am. To all of you, and I bring to you cytology of lymph nodes. Now, enlarged lymph nodes mean trouble. Trouble somewhere within the patient, trouble for the treating physician, and trouble for the interpreting cytologist. And sometimes errors do creep in, and it can be minimized if a proper approach is adopted. So first, let's have a look at a general algorithmic approach that will help minimize these errors, and then we'll see a few cases to which it is applied. Now, a patient of lymphadenopathy is sent for FNA for various reasons, but, but most commonly, it is for finding the cause of enlargement, so should we immediately go in for an FNA? The answer is obviously no, because we first need to assess and select the cases. And when we examine the patient, note whether the lymph node is single, multiple, if multiple, whether it is unilateral, bilateral, generalized, its size, whether it's discrete or matted, its consistency, and so on. Sometimes in case of small lymph nodes, where the focus of infection is obvious, the procedure can be deferred until completion of antibiotic course. But in such cases, even a few cells suffice. And in the case of a dilemma, always examine the patient personally and elicit all relevant history because the importance of clinical radiologic correlations cannot be overemphasized. We'll see it in the subsequent cases. And now coming to the smears, one should first screen and see whether it is predominantly necrotic or cellular. If the necrosis is very dense, often no interpretation is possible. However, when there is a clinical suspicion of malignancy, 
Keep your eyes open for such malignant cells, especially squamous cell carcinoma, as it can often undergo liquefactive necrosis and even suppuration. But when the necrosis appears granular with such irregular eosinophilic structures, and also in the cases where pus is aspirated, always remember to get an AFP done along with other relevant microbiologic investigations. And if the aspirate is mucoid, especially in an immunocompromised host, in the MTG stain, just lower the condenser and make sure you're not missing a cryptococcus. And, and I'm stressing on this because these trivial steps are the ones that are often forgotten. And if it is cellular, we first need to confirm that it is a lymphoid population and not some other round cell tumor. So look for these lymphoglandular bodies, preferably known as lymphoid globules, which are these round, pale blue cytoplasmic fragments that vary in size and number and are derived from the fragile cytoplasm of these lymphocytes. See this out pouching here, it is fragmented to form, to form a lymphoid globule, and this is best appreciated in the MGG state. And now that we are sure it's a lymph node, Next, we look at the population and see whether it is polymorphic, that is a mixed population of cells, or whether there is a monotony. And a closer look at the polymorphic population, here you can see the small, dark, mature lymphocytes, the intermediate cells, and the larger ones. And this polymorphous population makes up the vast majority of cases with the reactive lymph node being most common, where you can see the lymphohistocytic groups with tingible body macrophages. And another common cause in India is a granulomatous lymphadenitis, where you can see these epithelial cells with the reactive lymphoid population in the background, with or without necrosis. And another common cause in the elderly is metastasis, where the foreign population should not be missed. Now, few lymphomas can show a polymorphic picture, such as Hodgkin's lymphoma, where one needs to be very careful, while the large cell lymphomas are usually recognized. And the monomorphic population can be categorized into small cells that is slightly larger than a small lymphocyte, medium size that is about twice the size, and large cells that is three times or about the size of a nucleus of a macrophage. Now, the differentials of each category include both lymphomas and non-lymphomatous conditions, but monotony is more commonly seen with lymphomas. So, with a monomorphic population, be alert. Pay attention to the cytoplasmic details, the nuclear details, the background for apoptosis, mitosis, and debris, and this will help narrow down the differentials and if the features are suggestive of lymphoma, Always remember to recommend confirmation by either IHC or flow cytometry. And FNC is of immense value, especially when performing a biopsy is not feasible. Now there's always an inconclusive group. Here you can see this polymorphous population, some very large cells, very angry looking, many mitosis, immunoblasts, plasma cytoid cells. And then we feel, is it highly reactive or is it something more than that? Now, when we are unsure, we should always follow up these cases, correlate with serological tests, repeat FNA if required, and if it still persists, recommend biopsy. Now, all these images were from a 12 years male with history of fever that had responded to treatment, but the lymph nodes had persisted. And correlation with the peripheral blood smear and serology helped in the diagnosis, and after a month, the lymph nodes regressed. And based on this general algorithmic approach, it has been seen that in 86% of cases, biopsy can be avoided and further management can be planned. But one needs to be cautious as errors can occur at every step, and any error will directly affect the management that ranges from a course of antibiotics to ancillary tests and even biopsies. Now, errors do occur, but what is more important is to learn from our past mistakes so as to avoid repeating the same in future. And now, let's see a few cases that I call trouble-trouble, as they were double pathologies in each. 
Now, the first case is of an elderly male with generalized lymphadenopathy and weakness, and smears from the inguinal lymph node showed moderate cellularity with lymphoid population, fibrosis, and disc coil structure. And the adjacent area, we had this. And what do you think it is? This structure, this elongated structure. We are all familiar with this form of phylaria, that is microphylaria, but we are confused when we see something like this in the scanner view. So for the benefit of the residents, I'll quickly show you the entire phylaria family that can be seen in cytosmeres, and I'm very fond of this collection of mine. You can identify the adult from its sheath. Can you see the striations here? And when you focus on the internal structure, you can even identify it as female from the ova and coil larvae within, which gets scattered when the sheath gets fragmented during smear preparation. Here's the ova, the coil larva, the partly uncoiled larvae, and I call this the chuckly and shear effect. And here's the gravid female. The gravid female with the microphylaria around it, and you can even identify the male. Now, coming back to the case, we identified the phylaria, but what didn't fit in was the generalized lymphadenopathy, and there seemed to be a monotony in the small lymphoid population. So, what did the FNA from other lymph nodes show? You can see many smudge cells in a hemorrhagic background, and the predominant cells were the small lymphoid cells. They had scanty cytoplasm, round nucleus, clumped chromatin, and occasional small nucleus. There were few slightly larger cells. The peripheral blood smear had not been done. And now here we can see small lymphocytes, mud cells, the typical picture of CLN, and in a thick smear, a lone microphylaria was also found. In the hemat section, the bone marrow too had similar findings, and on flow, it was confirmed as SLN CLN along with incidental detection of phylaria. Now let's have a look at these three images. Think they look very similar. While this image is from a solitary long standing lymph node, these two images are from confirmed lymphoma. Now, the differentials of the monotonous, small, and intermediate population includes the quiet, that is, the inactive lymph node, and a long list of lymphoma. So, in a monomorphic population, what is important is to identify and segregate the inconsequential, that is, the innocuous ones from the worrisome ones that require further investigations. So when the features are suggestive of a lymphoma, always put in a recommendation for confirmation and typing. And these small and intermediate lymphoid populations perform well in flow cytometry. So what are the lessons learned? In a case of generalized lymphadenopathy, perform FNA from at least two different sites and don't forget to take a peripheral blood smear and preferably avoid aspirating inguinal lymph node alone as there is often more fibrosis with a mixed reactive population and of course the distractors. Now notice the distractors but don't miss the overall picture because yes, phylaria needs to be noted, reported and eradicated but not at the cost of missing a malignancy and the importance of clinical correlation cannot be overemphasized. Now, the monomorphic lymphoid population has various differentials. So, when the features are suggestive of a lymphoma, always recommend further workup. So, follow the algorithmic approach, sort out the inconsequential one, select the worrisome one, give your interpretation with the relevant recommendation. Now, this next case is of a 43 years male with generalized lymphadenopathy, that is, axillary, inguinal, intra abdominal lymph nodes with mildly enlarged liver, spleen, and history of fever and weight loss. The smears were cellular with a lot of debris in the background, and the cells were predominantly dispersed, some fibrotic fragments, and it appears to be a population of large cells. And a closer view, you can see the background debris. I've increased the light for better details, and you can see that the cells have nuclei about two to three times larger than a small lymphocyte with moderate amount of indefined cytoplasm, cytoplasm 
smooth nuclear contours, open chromatin, and single to multiple nuclei. Now, as the cytoplasm was very fragile, lots of lymphoglandular bodies can be seen. There's debris, apoptotic bodies, and many bare nuclei. Now, these bare nuclei, you can see here, see here have clumped together, mimicking nuclear molding, which is seen in small cell carcinomas. But the accompanying atypical lymphoid population prevents a misinterpretation. So this was a case of large cell lymphoma and confirmation and typing was recommended by flow cytometry, but rather immunohistochemistry is preferable as immunophenotyping of large cell lymphoma by flow cytometry may give a false negative report due to the disruption of the fragile cytoplasm during processing, causing selective loss of the neoplastic large cell. And this potential pitfall can be avoided by correlating with the cytomorphology. But as flow is being done in our department since the last few years, the patient was called for a repeat SNA for flow cytometry, and it was then that he showed us his HIV report, and it was positive. And as is the routine protocol in our department, the remaining dry smear was stained for AF, and it was positive. And retrospectively, we viewed the MGG smears, and on cutting of the light slightly, the negative images could be identified. And large B cell lymphoma was confirmed by flow cytometry. Now, in an immunocompetent individual, we get proper granulomas of the active lymphoid population with or without necrosis. And AFB is often not found even after an extensive search. But in an immunocompromised host, you can get only cutaneous necrosis, sometimes suppuration, sometimes just foaming cells, and even a lymphoplasmacytic reaction. But always put in an AFP, and more often than not, you will be justified and rewarded because you, you don't have to search for the AFP, they'll be looking up at you. So, so this was the case of diffused large B cell lymphoma and tuberculosis in an HIV positive patient. I initially thought it was quite rare, but a literature search yielded several case reports and short case series about this co coexistence. And we are all aware that the incidence of lymphomas and opportunistic infections increases many fold with HIV infection. So that brings us to the lessons learned. The first point is a warning, especially for all the residents that regard every patient with generalized lymphadenopathy as high risk and take due precautions during the procedure because it's any time better to be safe than sorry. Next point is if the aspirate is scanty, it's better to keep the snails air dried because Lymphoid population is best appreciated in the MGG stain and the rest can be used for special stains. At the screening level, always give due importance to the background in every smear. I admit that in this case it is faulty. We just presume that the debris was due to the fragile cell. And the cytomorphologic features of a large cell lymphoma is usually recognizable. But we need to be alert and observe any additional feature because in the setting of HIV, awareness and vigilance regarding the concurrent occurrence of opportunistic infections and neoplasms is important because there may be more than what meets the eye. Now, the third case is of a young male with unilateral cervical lymphadenopathy, associated fever, weight loss, and he had received some treatment for the same of which he had no record. And when there was improvement, he stopped the treatment on his own. And then since two months, they had started increasing again. Now, FME was done. And the smears were moderately cellular, predominantly dispersed lymphoid population. But what catches the eye on low bar are these clusters. Are they clusters or are they giant cells? And a closer view, we can appreciate the polymorphic lymphoid population, the histiocytic proliferation, few large cells, some eosinophils, and these clusters. Let's zoom in on it. And now we can see 
that these are large histiocytes with abundant pale cytoplasm, single to multiple nuclei. The nuclei are large with fine chromatin prominent nucleoli, and the histocytes show characteristic intact lymphocytes and plasma cells within the cytoplasm. That is, they are ingested and not superimposed, and this is indicated by the thin clear space, the thin halo around each cell. That is, it is within the intracytoplasmic vacuole, and this is in peripolysis, which is seen with SHML, that is, reside Dortman disease, and it needs to be differentiated from the lymphohistiocytic aggregates, where the lymphocytes are adherent to the superficial cytoplasm of the dendritic cells and the tangible body macrophages that have ingested apoptotic cell and uh, nuclear debris and these are not intact lymphocytes. Now, the close differentials include Langerhans cell histiocytosis that show lymphocytes, plasma cells, eosinophils, and histiocytes, but the cells here have abundant cytoplasm with elongated grooved nuclei and fine chromatin. And also, a close differential is Kimura's disease, where you have these eosinophils, the reactive lymphoid population and polycaryocytes, but not empiripolysis. And what we know about SHML is that it is a benign histiocytic proliferative disorder characterized by lymphophagocytosis. It is self-limiting and clinically present with painless bilateral cervical lymphadenopathy with fever and weight loss. So the clustering was explained, but what about the eosinophils and these atypical cells? You can see it here. And on further screening, even few epithelial cells were seen. Now, epithelial cells can occur in various non neoplastic and neoplastic conditions, but SHML, well, we couldn't find any such association. So we decided to review the case, and the feature favoring SHML was. A young patient with cervical swelling, fever, weight loss, histiocytic proliferation, and enterocolosis. But what wasn't fitting in was the was unilateral lymph nodes, previous history of treatment, and the decrease and then increase in the swelling, and the presence of epithelial cells, eosinophils, and these atypical cells. So when in doubt, we decided to personally evaluate the patient. And then we noticed this car, and then he gave us the information of a past history of uh, FNA and biopsy for which he had received treatment. So we retried and reviewed the earlier slides and records. And here you can see the reactive lymphoid population, occasional eosinophils, nice RS cells, and the previous cyto report was a Hodgkin's lymphoma. And that had been confirmed on the histopath. He had received few cycles of chemotherapy. When he improved, he discontinued, discontinued the treatment. Now everything fell into place. And there are several reports of the concurrent involvement of lymph node by lymphoma and SHML. It's not just Hodgkin's lymphoma, but other lymphomas too show such concurrent occurrence. And the diagnosis of Hodgkin's lymphoma and SHML can be established individually based on the characteristic features. But on cytology, the concurrent occurrence of the two gave rise to such a confusing picture that had it not been for the previous medical records, I wouldn't ever have thought of Hodgkin's. Actually, SHML usually undergoes spontaneous regression and hence should not impact the clinical decision as it has no impact on the clinical outcome. The main thing is that lymphoma should not be missed. So the lessons learned, first and foremost, that it is vital to elicit all relevant past history regarding treatment received and investigation done. And in a known case of malignancy, Repeat FNA should be done whenever clinically indicated because it could be a recurrence, a progression, transformation, or even a concurrent condition. Though rare, SHML may coexist and then it proves to be such a distraction as the empiricolysis is so eye-catching and low power that a more significant pathology 
requiring immediate attention may be missed. Give due importance to every cell in a smear. It could be the usual or the unusual. Anything unexplained needs to be analyzed. Just don't ignore it as one pathology does not preclude another. We saw lymphoma, small and large. We saw Hodgkin's and SHML, TB, filaria. But what makes up the vast majority of cases is non-specific reactive lymphadenopathy. And this last case is of an elderly male who was a known asthmatic and had bilateral enlarged cervical lymph nodes. FNA was done and showed a mixed population of lymphocytes and lymphohistiocytic groups and tangible body macrophages. Now, these lymphohistiocytic aggregates or groups are derived from the germinal center and are composed of reactive lymphoid population, the centrocytes, centroplasts, small lymphocytes, all of which adhere to the syncytial cytoplasm of the dendritic reticulum cells that have oval or round nuclei with a smooth nuclear membrane, uniformly distributed chromatin. So this was a case of reactive lymphadenopathy. But the clinicians wanted a review of the slide stating that the patient had been admitted in the past and had responded to steroids but this time he was not responding, rather he was deteriorating. So the slides were reviewed and other than a few eosinophils and mast cells, there was no dilemma regarding the diagnosis of reactive lymphadenopathy. Now this patient also had coccyx expectoration and the sputum sample, it was adequate. And they, then there were these clusters that made us think, is it some malignancy? Have we missed a metastasis in the lymph node? But the presence of these ciliated cells, you can see it here, the goblet cells, and somewhat flat sheets all indicated that these were creola bodies, which are hypoplastic reactive bronchial epithelium. And along with it, we had these eosinophils and charcot laden crystals. And she also, we had Kirschman spirals, which are casts of inspissated mucus with coiled dark central axis and pale gray periphery. But this one looked different. And there were a few more. Initially, we thought, could it be an extraneous contaminant? But considering the presence of eosinophils and the patient being on steroids, we asked for fresh sputum sample and we could view them live. But I'm sorry, I'm unable to show it here. And these were larvae of strongyloids, stercolalis. So this was a case of strongyloids, stercolalis hyperinfection in an asthmatic patient. Now, strongyloidiasis may be totally asymptomatic, have mild symptoms, or rarely it may even be fatal. In an immunosuppressed individual, autoinfection is accelerated leading to hyperinfection that is a tremendous increase in the number of worms which becomes detectable at extra intestinal sites especially the lung limiting exacerbation of copd unfortunately a specific test is lacking and a definitive diagnosis depends on the detection of larvae but by then it is often fatal so to conclude Reactive lymph nodes are very common, often with no identifiable cause. But if there's anything un unusual, just follow them up because there may be a story behind it, as in this case, what started off as just another reactive lymph node could have been fatal, but the timely detection and treatment led to a happy ending. Thank you so much. So that was a very wonderful talk and uh, thank you Supreeta with uh, sharing your interesting cases with us and uh, as, as far as we are supposed to deal with lymph node, we should never be satisfied with one condition. Always you should remember Pepsi ad, ye dil mange more and search for another pathology if you have something in doubt. So. I think the participants also want something more. Are there any questions in the chat box? Shraddha, can we take two questions? Uh, we have a question, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Is cell block helpful for lymph node cytology in lymphoma? 
Definitely. See, actually, when I was uh, touching on the lymphomas, uh, I think my internet. Am I am I audible? Yeah, yeah. yeah yes, yeah, So when I was touching on the lymphomas, that this my presentation today, what I did was just an approach where not to uh, uh, go wrong, where to be alert. So what I did was, if it is a small cell lymphoma, small and intermediate group, you can go in for a flow cytometry. It performs very well in the ones which, you know, because of the fragile cytoplasm, they tend to get uh, destroyed and they are sometimes negatively reported. There's a false negative report in the uh, in your uh, flow cytometry. So in such cases, and especially where the patient, uh, you in abdominal lymph nodes or he's medically unfit, it is in those cases where you have to give a report, okay? You may, if flow is not possible, do a repeat aspirate, repair up the cell block. And uh, Siddham sir know, has, gives a wonderful thing about how to deal with the cell block. So I think sir will be the best person to talk about cell block. And it helps them, especially in the medically fit and deep is not possible. That is, yes, definitely. Yeah, that was a wonderful presentation. And uh, as you mentioned about the cell block, uh, these days there are a lot of immunomarkers which are evaluated by flow, could also be evaluated by immunohistochemistry. And in the event when the cytoplasm is so fragile that you may have mostly bare nuclei, in that situation, definitely the cell block. And in that case, uh, I always, I mean, I'm, in fact, uh, FNA is also my area of uh, significant interest, both from the technology and interpretation point of view. And so I might share a small uh, experience here. Normally you perform the FNA with the 25 gauge or finer needle and get good cytology preparations. Once you have one or two good cytology preparations, then your focus could be get the material for the ancillary testing. In this case, if you think there is a need of cell block, then just do it with the 18 gauge needle aspirate as much as possible material, let it come in the syringe and then let it clot there. And then take some, uh, mm -hmm. let, it, it, let it be there for five, seven minutes. So it will clot depending what your the clotting time is. Then aspirate some 10% formalin in it, leave it for five, 10 minutes and take out that clot from the other end of the syringe and that your cell block is ready. It gives a wonderful, I mean, some of the time the core biopsies will not be good. With 18 gauge, uh, but that is important. I mean, all the residents and the uh, fellows uh, who are in the training should understand that for getting good cytology material, it has to be finer needle. And for getting a good cell block, if you want, then it, it can come in the syringe and so use 18 gauge needle. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah, that was a nice experience, sir. And uh, can I ask one question, Supreeta? Are there any more questions in the chat box? No, ma'am. Please uh, go ahead, ma'am. See, nowadays uh, we have Paris system for urine reporting, Bethesda for thyroid and uh, cervical. Uh, can you comment something on uh, Sydney system of reporting for lymph nodes? Uh, can we yeah, apply uh, this in the initial first case you showed, the inconclusive one? Will it be helpful? Yeah, the Sydney system is system which I was searching for it, but it has not yet hit the yeah. market. And uh, I guess it will be there soon. Now, ACTA is a system for categorization and better communication based on which recommend recommendations can be done. Okay. So, uh, what I have done as an approach that would, as per the Sydney system, they have done uh, two systems of uh, this. First one, is just a diagnostic uh, 
was the very highly reactive group, uh, yeah. highly reactive where we are not applicants. And the recommendation is uh, what they give is either you follow up the cases or uh, if required, you may do a repeat FNA or a late. Uh, but the last resort is a uh, yes. biopsy group uh, that cases would go into the or typical lymphoid cells of unstable of undetermined significance. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the system has the same thing. That is, this is better for a better communication with the clinicians. I think once it hits the market, it will be a, a, a good uh, thing again for a thesis. So it will be more of a standardization of reporting pattern, more on the standardizing, uh, common standardization for the reporting pattern. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you organizers for giving me this opportunity to chair the session. Over to you, Shraddha. Thank you, Dr. Suprita, ma'am, for demystifying you, such a complex topic and also addressing the common diagnostic challenges we face during reporting lymph node cytology. Thank you, Dr. Anupama Gupta, ma'am, for joining us. Uh, moving over to our next talk, and a sequel to the previous one by Dr. Vinod Chidam, sir, I invite Dr. Dharati Bhatt, ma'am, to kindly chair this session. Dr. Dharitri Bhatt, ma'am, is uh, currently associated with GMC Nagpur and working as an associate professor. She has pursued her MBBS and MD in pathology. Uh, ma'am has a postgraduate uh -huh. diploma in biomedical informatics with a vast 29 years of teaching experience and has been a PG guide for the last 18 years. She has been a moderator for various national conferences and workshops in gynecological cytology, breast cytology, and fluid cytology. She has many publications in international, national, state, as well as regional journals. She has a special interest in dermatopathology, gynecological pathology, and cytopathology. Ma'am has been invited as a faculty for various regional, state, and national conferences, workshops, and CMEs. She has conducted UG and PG quizzes and has been teacher in charge of <coughs> quiz training. Ma'am has guided several award-winning papers and poster presentations at various state and national level conferences. We welcome you, ma'am. Good morning, all. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. You're audible. Yes, ma yes, yes. Good morning, all. Let's move on to the second part of the lecture by Dr. Siddham. I'm sure you all are eagerly waiting to listen about the innovative technique that is KEEP subtractive coordinate immunoreactivity pattern. So over to sir for next lecture. Thank you again. Uh, and that was a wonderful uh, impact presentation. Uh, seen a lot of uh, <laughs> infective and parasites and other uh, organisms after a long time. <laughs> so uh, here uh, you see one and then you can see it maybe after two years. Uh, so that was really nice to see uh, many of those uh, after a long time. Let me share the screen and I will start with the second part. Is it visible? Yes, yes. Yes, sir. Okay, okay good. So again, uh, the initial uh, acknowledgements and uh, are same as we did for the first. And we already discussed about the part one, which I highlighted how to process the specimen and uh, gave importance to the second foreign population uh, concept, which uh, if uh, once over a period of time, uh, once you get used to the seeing the panorama of reactive mesothelial cells, uh, that makes it really easy and very simple. But uh, even after that, there are occasions where you need to get some objectivity and for that, uh, immunohistochemistry can be applied. Generally, when we apply the immunohistochemistry in other situations other than the serous fluids, it's uh, mostly straightforward. Uh, it's not that uh, problematic. But for the immunohistochemistry to be applied for the serous effusion fluids, then we should be a little more uh, careful and should have a methodical approach. 
And to give it a little more formal pattern, I had described long back the subtractive coordinate immune reactivity pattern abbreviated as KIP approach or SCIP. And we'll discuss that in this particular presentation. When it comes to the evaluation of immunocytochemistry or immunohistochemistry, whatever you want to call, because it is for cytopathology specimens, we are calling it immunocytochemistry. There are a lot of uh, variables and those could start from the way it is collected, when it is connected, collected, how it is transported and to the level how it is processed. And sometimes these are the things which are relatively underestimated and that can lead to entirely suboptimal outcome of the evaluation. And uh, that way that expensive uh, modality will become uh, non-effective. Uh, what is the uniqueness of effusion immunocytochemistry? And that uniqueness is uh, same way as we did it for morphology. If you have a mechanism to identify a population which is other than the reactive mesothelial cells and the inflammatory cells, that is to identify the second foreign population, you are done. This nice, uh, that is a population which is a metastatic population. Once you know which is that population, then you have to follow that and find out what it is showing the immunoreactivity for. And that's the coordinate immunoreactivity. And generally you can't depend on one marker. You have to usually recommend it is two negative, two positive as everybody knows about it. And how to achieve that in the cell block of the um, serous fluid is the approach here. And for that, this is very simple that way, but unfortunately it is not uh, uh, formalized. And so I decided to describe it here and highlight. So when uh, we started in our lab, the same thing, I had a small in-service for the, all the immunohistochemistry stuff. And now just I say, perform its skip approach, one, two, three sequence and all those things. And they are very nicely doing it. What you do is the section should be all in a, a serial fashion. So we should know section number one, two, three in that order. And then all of them uh, uh, should, we should know about the sequence of it. And all of them should be oriented exactly the same way uh, and, and uh, then it's easy to follow. Let me highlight at this point only, when it comes to the peritoneal washings or for that matter, any washings, immunocytochemistry will not play a significant role. We can never say no, but hardly, hardly any time it will have any significant role. So do not uh, try to do uh, immunohistochemistry in such situation. And if you do it, make it sure you have a specific uh, point in view, uh, and so you are trying to evaluate that. Uh, one of the discussion will be required to find out where it will be required, and so to avoid that, I'm not touching uh, peritoneal washing and immunostochemistry here, and in general, we can say that you don't need it. Again, uh, you can always perform the immunocytochemistry on any specimen. People will say that, okay, uh, we can do it on um, smears, we can do it on cytospin or whatever. And again, the same situation will be there. If you perform it, make it sure that it matches with the surgical pathology type specimen. And so it is very important to have a nicely prepared formalin fix paraffin embedded tissue type uh, situation. So you make a cell block, fix it in formalin, and then make the paraffin embedding. If you use other preparations, uh, you will have problem in comparing the, your data with the data which is from the literature which is based on the formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue section. So that point uh, is always important to be kept in mind and avoid the other distractions. Uh, reasons for variable reports include the sample size. Uh, if there is a big sample size, then you have a lot of cells. If the sample size is small, then the cells will be few and could be difficult to interpret. Then what fixatives are used, antigen retrieval methods, antibody clones use, antibody teeter, and other variations in immunostaining protocols. In addition to that, the proteinaceous effusion fluid might create an unexpected immunoreactivity and confused with the specifically the membranous pattern type of immunostaining. So those things should be kept in mind. If the findings are not equivocal, uh, not uh, they are not unequivocal, and not very clearly definitive, then it is always better to be conservative and not try to unnecessarily stretch it based on a few scant, poorly preserved specimen. Because effusion fluid will usually reaccumulate quickly if it is secondary to metastatic disease. And if it doesn't reaccumulate, then it's a good news. So you're not giving a false positive diagnosis. 
In that case, it is better to acquire a, a new sample or new specimen, which is not that difficult to collect. And it's not a very complicated and a very aggressive procedure. So tapping it may not be that difficult. So it is better to have a new specimen. And uh, it is uh, better to highlight that because uh, sometimes over a period of time, when you give the messages properly, they understand because many times they think that, okay, only two ML are required or three ML and they'll just send it. And we just give the report like that, it could be a problem. So at least I do this very often, whenever it is only a scant specimen, I highlight that only seven ML is submitted. And if there is any chance that it needs to be repeated, then I put a comment saying that recommend submission of most of the drain diffusion fluid up to 1000 ml because you don't want four ml or five four liter or five liter larger volume of specimen is facilitates retrieval of adequate cellular material in cell block section for immunocytic cytochemical evaluation and that message is important otherwise if you just say recommend repeat you will get again five ml or two ml next time and you will have the same problem when it comes to the interpretation of the immunistic chemistry again Though many of us we do it, but I would like to highlight it again for the junior uh, colleagues and even sometimes uh, for the uh, our senior colleagues, it can be uh, overlooked. And that is the part which I call it immunomorphology. Uh, just call it negative, positive may not be sufficient. And there are very good examples where you just say positive means what? For example, calretinin. Classically, calretinin should be a nuclear stain. By chance, you have cytoplasmic, it may not be, it's not equivalent to positive. Same thing is like S100 protein. It is a nuclear stain. If you see cytoplasmic, it is of no use. Sometimes cytoplasmic and nuclear for a particular situation might be useful. And then you'll have to specifically say that. So that immunomorphology is very important. Other classical example is polyclonal CEA when you are doing it for hepatocellular carcinoma. It is not positive or negative staining. It is the bile canalicular staining pattern, which is more useful. So you can't say just positive negative that way. And so uh, better to avoid it saying, and even calling it something positive negative, uh, positive negative may not be good. Usually we call it immunoreactive and non-immunoreactive. That is a better uh, scientific approach, but yes, loosely people do call positive negative. Again, these are those some of those uh, things everybody's aware of it. For example, calretinin WT1 is a nuclear stain. Uh, some of those also nuclear and cytoplasmic, but nuclear is more important. Uh, most of those are cytoplasmic, many of those are membranous, and then it could be microvillus. Classically, EMA and HBME, when it is possible, you are trying to call something as mesothelioma, and if it shows microvillus, then it is useful, and we'll see some images there, and more of those basically uh, different, uh, and that's what I use the word immunomorphology, and that should be practiced just like HNE. We just don't say the blue nucleus is the blue and the cyto uh, pink, uh, pink is the cytoplasm. Uh, there is a lot of features we evaluate there. It could be uh, clump chromatin, paracropatin clearing, nucleolus present, irregular of the nucleus, all those features we send, then we come to a conclusion. Similarly here also, we should start practicing evaluating other aspects. Many of us probably do, but I wanted to make it more formal and highlight that as immunomorphology. Similarly, when it comes to the mesothelial cells, as we are uh, highlighted already that the truffle border in diff specifically in difficult can be seen and shows that it is a cell with the microvilli. Same thing can be achieved even with the immuno staining. So uh, EMA and uh, HBME, even it stains, it shows this typical microvillus pattern. And if you really want to be <laughs> more uh, imaginative, you can go under oil and see, they can show that uh, uh, and it can become uh, easy to say that, oh, these are actually uh, mesothelial cells because adenocarcinoma also we should could be positive for HBME or uh, EMA, but it is that microvillus pattern we'll call it as uh, mesothelioma. And I usually don't use these stains for that, but when you want to, you could uh, highlight the microvilli portion of it, and that will be a very nice example to highlight how immunomorphology is important, not just positive and negative. Similarly, pancytokeratin, again, I couldn't uh, um, make it that visible, but that uh, staining pattern is very typical along with the onion skinning type of a nice concentric pattern because it's a intermediate filaments. And so if you really have a nice staining, 
you can see it well in a uh, mesothelium as compared to other cells where it is random. Again, extension of uh, those imaginary uh, things which can help if you really want to use immunohistochemistry as a, in the form of immunomorphology. But generally, it's straightforward, either nuclear and cytoplasmic, for example, calatin is nuclear. Uh, uh, in a case where there is this mini proliferation spheres, the new neoplastic cells or tumor cells are negative for calatinin. And in the background, these react to mesothelial cells nicely show nuclear uh, calatinin. Similarly, WT1, which are not commonly used, but once in a while it is important to use, the mesothelial cells show nuclear immunoreactivity. Uh, very good stain is uh, B72.3 and BRIP4. I don't know where the BRIP4, it will come, I think. So anyhow, B B72.3 is for the metastatic disease, usually adenocarcinoma have that. And in this category is BRIP4 and Claudine 4. But B72.3 is not that sensitive, so very rarely I use it. When it comes to the vimentin, again, as you know, all the reactive mesothelial cells will be vimentin immunoreactive, and of course, the inflammatory cells will be immunoreactive. So I use vimentin to make a basic map, and again, we'll see some of the pictures afterwards. So anything which doesn't stain with vimentin is consistent with the metastatic disease, and it's a very simple uh, method to detect the metastatic disease in serous fluids. Though vimentin is not that popularly used uh, immunostain in other situations, but in the setting of uh, serous fluids, it's a very good uh, and simple method. And we'll also discuss the two color staining which we use in our lab uh, at the end. Again, uh, uh, LCA and CD68 and all those things can be used to identify the uh, leukocytes. And of course, uh, CD68 can be for, used for identifying the histocytes. Uh, not very significantly important, but can be used. Just as a general mention, I usually do is that in the CD68, there are different clones, but the PGM one is a good clone to show less sensitive, less uh, non-specificity. If you use the other clones, many times you get a lot of non-specificity and non-histocyte cells could also be staining. Again, about the CA, in this case, it is a monoclonal CA, which is more sensitive for the carcinoma cells, not the polyclonal CA. If you are using polyclonal CA, usually, as you know, use it for hepatocellular carcinoma where you will see the bile canalicular pattern. So that again, immunomorphology is more important. Uh, CDX2 as usual is a nuclear stain. A TTF1 is a nuclear stain. Many of those nuclear stain you already know like P40, P63 and other thing. And we already discussed about HBME, EMA, mock 3 t one but these are not that reliable in the setting of uh, uh, serous fluid, but I'm just showing the morphological pattern uh, for the junior colleagues. When it comes to the EMA, as we mentioned, or HBME, even the adenocarcinomas can be positive, but there it is more cytoplasmic, irregular, or sometimes slightly membranous, but it will not have that microvillous pattern. So that positive negative is not important. It is the pattern which is important, and if you are going to use it. But anyway, these are not very useful uh, to specifically see any specific uh, uh, adenocarcinoma versus meso mesothelioma, most of the time, that's what you are going to do the differential. And so not much of a pattern, but if you do it, make it sure that uh, this pattern is followed. Similarly, when it comes to the clear cut differentiation between the mesothelial cells versus not mes non mesothelial cells, I already highlighted that you should have two negatives and two positives. So if you are calling something as adenocarcinoma cells, in those adenocarcinoma cells, I should see two negative adenocarcinoma marker and two positive adenocarcinoma marker. And those some of the examples uh, we'll see, but uh, you can imagine what I'm trying to say. But in this very good strain is a BRIP4, which gives rise to like more than 90% of the adenocarcinoma are positive there. And when I uh, compare that with B72.3, as I already said, that B72.3 B72 is relatively non-specific as we can see in this example. It's not staining the metastatic disease, but BRIP4 could easily detect that. And the recently described very good stain is Claudine 4. So BRIP4 and Claudine 4 together can be two nice adenocarcinoma marker. And then of course, side by side, if you have vimentin and calretinin, and calretinin should be negative, vimentin should be negative. So automatically it confirms with more objectivity that is adenocarcinoma marker. 
So <clears throat> basically, when you are uh, performing the immunohistochemistry or immunocytochemistry of the serous fluids, it is important to make it sure that you have a very specific uh, panel. And that panel should include a system because as compared to the surgical biopsies, where we know that this is the um, epithelial component, this is a stromal component and everything is well oriented. There is architecture to it. When it comes to the cell block, and more so with the serous fluid, you don't know which, what, which component is what, unless it is a clear cut, obvious malignancy. So let's go to the extreme example. You have a case where it is a lobular carcinoma of breast and those lobular carcinoma cells look like reactive mesothelial cells. So with confidence, you cannot say which are the reactive mesothelial cells or which are the metastatic um, uh, lobular carcinoma cells. So to create that basic map, the immunohistochemistry will allow you, if you have an approach which will highlight the mesothelial cells and inflammatory cells and others. So we already said that mesothelial cells are immunoreactive for vimentin, and here vimentin is red. Can you see the red, say, the, the, the background? So all those cells are either the inflammatory cells or the mesothelial cells. And in that, anything which is negative for vimentin, but immunoreactive for BRP4, is consistent with the metastatic disease. So if you see even at the low power here, you will see that there are a lot of tumor cells and there are admixed with the inflammatory cells. So the moment you put uh, this slide, immediately you identify the second foreign population and you can make a diagnosis that these are the metastatic cells. Now what you do with the skip approach, because you know this level is adjacent to this, this level is adjacent to this, they are exactly oriented. And so a group like this will be present at least in four or five levels and you can follow them and find out what is the coordinate immunoreactivity of these cells. So let's say this was uh, CK7 positive. We know that uh, reactive mesothelial cells are also cytokeratin immunoreactive, but we can easily see that these cells are not uh, uh, mesothelial cells because we have excluded that. This is not positive for or immunoreactive for vimentin. Now, if I see these cells, cytokeratin 7 positive, means these belong to the 7 category. And then I can put GATA3, ERPR, and other thing, and so it, it becomes breast. Or the same cells are positive for um, maybe uh, other markers like uh, TTF1 and others, so it is lung. So you just follow the coordinate immunoreactivity pattern. And that skip approach, if you look at the cartoons, you'll see that the same cells will be seen in adjacent level. And then depending on whether those are inflammatory cells, mesothelial cells, or those are metastatic carcinoma cells, or those metastatic non-carcinoma cells, you will see the pattern. So if it is a vimentin, this is a A, and that in that vimentin, all the cells are immunoreactive, those are mesothelial cells or inflammatory cells, and then carcinoma cells stand out prominently. You just follow those carcinoma cells in other markers, whether they are positive for pancytokeratin or LCA, calretinin, WT1, and then accordingly come to a conclusion, what is the nature of that cell. And similarly, when it comes to non-carcinoma, those will be immunoreactive for vimentin, no doubt. But when you go for pancytokeratin and other marker, they will not be reacting. And so the same cells can be followed. So depending on uh, a case, you will have to be imaginative, but that skip approach will help you to form, follow them properly. Luckily, as I highlighted, 90% of the metastasis in adult population are adenocarcinoma, and your example makes it easy, even with that two-color immunostaining when you have vimentin plus BRP4, and you just have the diagnosis there as a metastatic uh, uh, disease. So this is the just to highlight that uh, when you are taking the uh, four micron three sections, even the small cell might be there, even a single cell, if it is a 20 micron, it should be seen in about four or five sections adjacent to it. And if it is a bigger group, of course, it will be seen in more. But unless you have a proper relationship of that known, it will be very difficult for you to uh, follow them. And of course, they should be oriented exactly the same. So basically, you are creating a cinematographic type um, film, and then you just follow it. So this is a good example where uh, courtesy of uh, AV Bio Innovation, which is the company which makes next-gen cell blocking, these are the cell blocks made by that. And there is that AV marker there, which gives a nice way to orient them properly. And then you can follow the cells in different wells and go, uh, go on uh, uh, do, uh, evaluating the coordinate immunoreactivity pattern. 
again uh, uh, other advantage which we are not discussing today but by chance if you want that these cells are the one which are good number of them and you want to do the molecular stuff you can core this out and send for molecular and these are the some of the algorithms which i will be trying to do it quickly we started well 10 or something so 45 minutes means we have 20 minutes more i think i should finish it in that time so if you have a basic panel as we discuss about which is vimentin and bari before i should have modified it now because we do it two color and in that if you find second foreign population then it is to be evaluated whether those are cytokeratin positive vimentin negative or six cytokeratin negative vimentin positive if they are cytokeratin positive vimentin negative is consistent with carcinoma and then you just uh, proceed with the other immuno panels uh, and i have to modify some of this unfortunately i am using the old one but uh, you will get the message uh, that uh, this is how you usually evaluate the different uh, immuno markers on that and come to a conclusion whether those are carcinoma lymphoma melanoma or sarcoma uh, if it is a second foreign population that's easy but if it is not a second foreign population then your concern is whether it is mesothelium or not and for that you have to have qualitative and quantitative features and if required uh, these days we could use some molecular uh, evaluations which we'll see the uh, algorithm at the end again uh, if the features are present uh, this quantitative and qualitative features of mesothelioma with clinical scenario of thickening of pleura and other occupational history of asbestos and other then if it is present it is consistent with melanoma uh, mesothelioma and then if it is not present then it is just react to mesothelial cells again few of the examples where we can see and follow those cinematographic pictures so that same group is vimentin negative so it is definitely a second foreign population of adenocarcinoma and this patient had of course colon adenocarcinoma and then cdx2 was positive that's even ck20 was immunoreactive and accordingly it was consistent with metastatic colonic adenocarcinoma and this is an example where uh, we started using the sec two color population or two color uh, vimentin uh, and bari p4 so bari p4 is brown, uh, brown and the vimentin is red and so whatever the brown i'm seeing as a second foreign population it is consistent with metastatic disease and if you see this is immunoreactive for paxet which is consistent with mullerian primary and patient had ovarian carcinoma so it is straightforward and easily uh, confirmed in addition to this we had evaluated other uh, two color uh, combinations and just wanted to share some of the things here uh, as a story where uh, it doesn't mean that you imagine two color and just do it and it should be effective it may not work and so it has to be very carefully evaluated first validated and then only you can use it reason being the first immune marker you do and then you go through a lot of reagents and then you are putting a second immune marker the first uh, reagents might have destroyed the immunoreactivity of the other marker and it might be altered so it has to be evaluated properly and we now experience some of the combination did not work but for example you do cytokeratin and vimentin that might help and if you are thinking a breast cancer case that will be useful so all your react to mesothelial cells and um, mm, inflammatory cells will be immunoreactive but if you see some cells which are cytokeratin 7 immunoreactive which will be red color and it may have also vimentin means those are react to mesothelial cells but if you purely have red color means only cytokeratin 7 positive that is consistent with breast if you want you can use that combination same way there are other combination which we tried vimentin and cytokeratin 7 we already discussed but it could be calretinin and other markers so accordingly various uh, combinations can be used so for example here it is an adenocarcinoma <coughs> of stomach so the cells are immunoreactive for cytokeratin so they are nicely uh, red but uh, we did vimentin also and then it automatically highlighted in that the reactive mesothelial cells which are very few and other side calretinin uh, uh, did not stay immunostain the um, uh, tumor cells but it did uh, stain the reactive mesothelial cells and that's the cell block showing obviously malignant cells here you don't have to do the immunos from that point of view but it was for 
finding out the primary, specifically when you do not know the diagnosis. And many of the cases of upper GI and pancreatic, sometimes there is no clear cut diagnosis to start with, contrary to breast and other conditions. So basically, these are the few examples of two color which we use, but at present, Vimentin and Buripi4 works really good. We wanted to try Vimentin and Claudin4. Maybe one of these days uh, we'll try to evaluate that. Uh, when it comes to the algorithm, as I said, if there is a effigen cytology, whatever the method you thought, it is not showing any malignant cells, that is two population, either by cytology, cytomorphology, or immuno, then you just report it as negative for malignant cells. But there could be occasions where it could be uh, definitely unequivocally positive, then you can just give the report. But issue comes when it is equivocal cases, when you are not sure whether that second foreign population is there or not. And for that group, you are, all the efforts are always that you do in a particular fashion, process the specimen properly, have the diff pick and pap smear, and if required, have a cell block, and the cell block should be treated and immunostained with the skip approach. Then you will have more success rate because you know, you never know unexpectedly where some cases would have challenge. So in the negative case, as I said, we just uh, reported as negative for malignant cells and that's straightforward. When it comes to, again, as usual, everybody likes different systems. I noted that, uh, but doesn't matter. Everybody will be same. This four system, we do it negative, atypical, suspicious, and positive. You give whatever the name to it, doesn't matter. So basically what is important is if it's a negative, it is straightforward, it's positive. Depending on the question, you might have what is the primary and all those things. Your main problem comes is in atypical and suspicious category. Don't just call it atypical and suspicious, leave that. You should have a nice explanation, nice differential diagnosis, nice recommendation. Then it will have that good role for atypical and suspicious. Otherwise, make it sure you do not call something atypical and suspicious. And as my one of my senior teacher used to say, we used to have 15, 20 cases a day, for example, and they will say, oh, you are only allowed one atypical per day. But even that is, that will be counted. So do not become an atypical cytopathologist. Always make it sure that you should be in a binary fashion, call it negative, positive. Of course, there are occasions where you need to, then you should do it properly. Again, when it is an sorry, equivocal situation, of course, there definitely the cell block will be useful. And that is, if by chance it is not available or the sample is sufficient, then in that case, you might be justified to even call it suspicious and then give the proper uh, recomm uh, recommendations. Specifically, we always say if it reaccumulates. If it is not reaccumulating, re then uh, you are in a, the, it's a good news for the patient. And most of the time, this is related with the scanned specimen, poorly preserved specimen, or cells are scanned. And so don't just call it definitive there. Uh, that level here, it is fine to call suspicious with proper note. If the cell block is available, and uh, your immunocytochemical characterization with the skip approach finds a second foreign population, then uh, you could, uh, oh, unfortunately, this is highlighting, hold on. Okay, so if it is available and immuno characterization shows that there is no negative population, you, because initially it was equivocal, so you don't know, uh, whether they are malignant cells even, and the second population will not be identified, then it is straightforward and nice objective confirmation that it's negative for malignant cells. And if you see a second foreign population, of course, you can say positive for malignant cells. And then of course, your goal is to find out the primary site, which if it matches with the history, that's fine. If it doesn't, uh, then make it sure that you have a proper differential diagnosis or possibility. If it is unequivocal for malignant cell, then straightforward, correlate with the clinical scenario, if that correlation is possible, then just try to find out a compare. I use the word comparative review. I pull out the old slides, compare with it. And if they are similar, then you say that they are comparable and uh, it's consistent with that. If uh, that's, as I said, comparable, then you just call it consistent with that primary site. If it is uh, not, then what you can do is just suggest not classical for the known primary site. And then of course, ask for the cell block because uh, you already have the cell block and then you can just do the proper evaluation and then give a proper differential diagnosis. Uh, if immunocytochemical characterization is performed, then 
depending on the amino profile. And if there is a second population, which is consistent with the particular primary X, Y, Z, and just sign out like that. If the amino profile is uh, uh, not distinct for a particular primary, then you will give obviously a differential diagnosis and then they will have to correlate with the imaging and the uh, clinical history. So that was about the second parent population, which invariably means a metastatic disease. But there are occasions you will not have a second foreign population. Instead, all the cells are mesothelial cells. You are sure it is not a second population. Of course, uh, uh, we are not talking about inflammatory cells here because we are not worried about uh, hematopoietic malignancy. We are ruling it out. And there are other ways of doing it. Most of the time there's history. We can always do the flow and then morphology will be different. But it's not adenocarcinoma and that's only the mesothelial cells. Your role is, your goal is to confirm whether they are reactive mesothelial cells or they are uh, neoplastic, in the means, means uh, whether they are uh, uh, malignant or not. And for that, I already said the way is to do the quantitative and qualitative evaluation. And that qualitative and quantitative evaluation would be uh, possible with the help of clinical history, uh, imaging studies, and in some cases, if required, we could use this algorithm. Again, we already use those adeno adenocarcinoma markers and mesothelial markers and came to conclusion is adenocarcinoma. We, can, we discussed that before. And if it is not adenocarcinoma marker, means it is suggestive of a mesothelial proliferation. If it is a mesothelial proliferation, then you can perform a immunostaining for BAP1, and if it's negative, again, that's a problem here. Negative stains are more uh, problematic to apply, but in this scenario, unfortunately, that's the only approach. So if it is negative, then it is consistent with mesothelioma. If it is not uh, negative, means it is positive, then you'll have to go to the next stage and find out if there is a MTAP immunostaining. If there is a diff loss of, again, here it is negative pattern. So if that loss of MTAP immunostaining is there, and if you have a cell block and you have done the CD, CDK N2A, sorry, the two is missing, CDK N2A fish, and that is deleted, then it is consistent with melanoma. Any other pattern which is not clear cut, undetermined, then you can go ahead and do the molecular test like uh, next gen sequencing and come to a conclusion. So recently, uh, molecular and combination of immuno is helping for the diagnosis of uh, mesothelioma. Again, most important, though in other situations, people have used the electron microscopy, it's not going to help here because uh, you'll have a problem in finding out which are the cells, are they really mesothelioma cells or mesothelial cells or tumor cells? And even if you identify, they could be reactive mesothelial cells and you could confuse for mesothelioma cells and it may not be easy to interpret in the fluids. And that's the reason why, and again, these days, electron microscopy is highly used because of the availability of good immunohistochemistry marker. So I think uh, with that, uh, I think I complete the presentations for both part one and part two. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful and informative session. We have a few questions in the comment box below. So uh, there's a question by Dr. Bhavna Mehta, uh, ma'am. So do we have any reference to suggest fluid up to 1000 ml required for good quality cell block? Uh, that will be uh, not a specific one, but it's based on my personal experience and I have been doing it for a long time. Again, uh, we already highlighted that it could be any, any volume, but if it is less than 50 ml, the chances of getting uh, good material is less. And more is uh, always good because then what you could do when it settles down, the cells will uh, sediment and you can discard the supernatant and that concentrated specimen you can process all. So you'll get as many cells as possible. And in the era nowadays, when we are looking for molecular tests, you need more and more uh, DNA material. So having more cells is always good. So that's the reason why up to 1000 because practically most of the time 1000 uh, ml bottles are available. But today only we had one case, uh, 7 ml, and it was a very cellular cell block. So, but does it mean routinely you would like to have 7 ml? No, then you will have a lot of cases where you will have a suboptimal. 
So if you have a choice, you have already collected it. Why don't you submit all of it, which is collected, but not three liter and four liter. That's the reason why you say 1000 ml as a practical upper limit. But I think even 500 will be okay. Even 300 will be okay. It's not a problem, but it should be more than about 50 to 100 uh, ml. Okay. Yes. And case, yes uh, as far as if, you, if you are talking about reference, it will be my books. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I would request our chairperson, Dr. Dharatri, but ma'am, to share her thoughts on this uh, session. Thank you, sir. Thank you for making a complicated technique sound so simple. Your simple way of finding solutions to practical problems faced by each pathologist all over the world has been a source of inspiration to all of us. I would like to suggest a small different full form of this skip technique and it is a suggestion by uh, Dr. Mohini Dave, but I liked it so I want to share and it is Siddham's cytological innovation for pathologists and uh, even I like this uh, name for skip technique. Uh, sir, I want to ask one question. Uh, it is actually very simple but I just want to ask whether uh, do the hemosiderin granules, intracytoplasmic hemosiderin granules, interfere with any interpretation for uh, uh, immunopositivity? Oh, that's a really good question. And thanks, thanks for such suggestion. <laughs> Some of you or somebody should publish that. Then that makes it <laughs> better probably than me saying it. But uh, at least I tried to give the formal. I, again, I said it's not a very big... Uh, uh, concept. Most of us probably were using it, but I wanted to make it a formalized one. And when we give the instructions to the histotechs and other, it becomes easy. I just gave the uh, my chapter to them and they just started using it immediately. Just by telling like that every time I had to reinvent, explain them, that becomes a problem. So if you standardize it, when there is a formalized name, it becomes easy. So thanks for doing that and suggesting that name. And uh, it's very nice of you. It is uh, your love and uh, admiration for us, which helps to go uh, and work uh, uh, for longer time. Uh, yeah, about the hemocytrin, uh, it depends on it. In the limits, it doesn't interfere that much because uh, most of us are uh, conversant with uh, identifying the brown pigment of the immunohistochemistry from the hemocytrin. Uh, that was probably your question. So. Like, let's see, you are evaluating a TTF1, uh, it will be nuclear stain and hemocytin is nothing to worry about in that situation, right? Uh, same thing is a problem in with melanoma we are talking. At least in melanoma case, because you want to see the nuclei and all those things, you might have to do the melanin bleach and then do the immuno and all those. But in general, the amount of hemocytin, which is usually present in the clinical specimens, usually it doesn't uh, interfere when it comes to the evaluation of immunohistochemistry. And worse than worst, a situation comes like that, then I will recommend to modify that and use a red chromogen instead of a brown chromogen. That's the simple uh, answer to it. Uh, other thing which probably will be more and which I didn't highlight more, but everybody is aware of it, but it probably is underestimated, is the blood interference. That's more problematic. What happens is if you use a specimen which has a lot of blood, and depending on which kind of uh, uh, methodology you are using, if you centrifuge it, as you know, all the nucleated cell, cells go to the top of the RBC column, so like a Buffy coat. And if you make it the sediment from the, uh, sorry, uh, cell block from the sediment, you are, most of the diagnostic cells are lost on the top. So you may not get good uh, diagnostic material in the cell block, that to start with. Second thing is, even if you get uh, good material in the cell block and RBCs, as you know, with the RBCs, the cells, uh, the sections will float, that will fold, and it makes messy. And specifically, if you are doing a immunohistochemistry on it, apart from the hemocytrin pigment uh, problem, uh, this uh, thing will float and create uh, messy in the sense it will contaminate, it will float on something, or come as a floater on something, and creates a lot of problem. And you might lose a small area which really had a diagnostic material, but because it floated away on that section, you will not see anything. So blood is one which is more problematic than hemocytin. I I think uh, that answered your question. Yes, sir. definitely. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. 
I thank you thank the organizer for giving me this challenge thank you ma'am thank you sir for uh, spending your valuable time in answering our queries i'm sure the skip approach would indeed expedite and simplify the immunocytochemical evaluation of effusion fluids thank you dr dharitri but ma'am for chairing the session and sparing your precious time thank you ma'am okay i think this is my last <laughs> yes sir and this is my last session right i will yes, be seeing the next one just in the background but yes, uh, before i leave i would like to thank everybody and the organizers and all the people who took lot of effort and thank uh, dr tamne uh, and uh, also dr uh, sancheti uh, for all their efforts and of course the entire team um, my my, my uh, family members the siddham foundation is thankful to make it sure that uh, my mom's memory is kept alive and we continue to celebrate her uh, life as far as we can and i am always available to the group and any there is any uh, other thing to share with you as you know uh, second edition of the serous fluid cytology book which uh, the first one is out of print so the second edition is under preparation and it has under a unique uh, uh, project probably many of you already know we call it cmas that is cytojournal monograph and atlas series the first is already out that is cell blockage p101 the second one is this second edition of the uh, book and that uh, 15 chapters are there seven chapters are already published as individual articles in cyto journal eight are in process and uh, thinking that by march april everything will be there so in april or may we'll have a book release ceremony on that and i will share the news with everybody and after that is a third book which is cmas which is dr kamal and uh, Uh, her group, uh, they are working hard on it. Uh, so probably that will be released by June, July. And thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Ajay, as usual for your all the efforts and uh, uh, your enthusiasm. Thank you. And <laughs> thank I, you, sir. It's all right. My dad wanted to be uh, there, but uh, now he felt sleepy, so he went for <laughs> for the bed. But he says uh, thanks to everyone. Okay. Yeah, thank you, sir. It's always a pleasure to have you. In fact, we are concluding here. We have to forego the next session for certain reasons. So, just Dr. Ankita Tamne would present the vote of thanks and uh, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Oh, okay. So anyhow, we are done. Okay. Concluding. Good. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, sir, for being there. Thank you. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. I, Dr. Ankita Tamne, for Honorary Secretary of APM, feel very privileged to present. the vote of thanks on this august occasion a big thank you to dr vinod siddham sir for being the prime speaker for this webinar and also helping us organize this webinar and sharing his amazing experience uh, knowledge in the field of cytopathology my regards and gratitude to dr bt siddham sir better half of late mrs sunanda siddham and father of dr vinod siddham sir for being present on this occasion and uh, showering his blessings on us also i thank the other family members of all the uh, of uh, shridham family for being a part of this webinar i thank dr suprita naik madam for a wonderful lecture on lymph node fnscs and sharing her experience i am thankful to dr ajay marawar sir for gracing this occasion i thank the chair persons dr mohini dave madam dr anupama gupta madam and dr dharitri bhat madam for chairing all the sessions um i thank dr shraddha ayer for being a very wonderful and extremely uh, efficient uh, moc for this webinar i thank dr prachi sanjeeti ma'am for uh, sharing the responsibility of organizing this webinar and she is always there thank you prachi ma'am and uh, right. last but not least thank you mr piyush from digishield for helping us uh, doing this uh, magnanimous uh, task of organizing organizing this online webinar uh, also thank you team vapm 2021 for helping throughout uh, thank you so much thank you all and i'm uh, like uh, if i've missed someone right. i'm really sorry but yeah thank you so much big thanks to all the attendees uh, i think we had a good number of attendees yeah. throughout thank you very yes, much yeah. thank we you conclude so here Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you everyone. Thank you.
Yeah, yeah. Thank you. 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 Yeah. Thank